Hello everyone, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the YNS Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. It's been nearly two weeks since the latest round of fighting between Israel and Hamas ended, but the issues that led to the escalation of violence remain unresolved and volatile. Unlike previous rounds of fighting, this time it was not only the IDF, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip that was involved, but also Palestinians in East Jerusalem and the West Bank and Arab and Jewish citizens of Israel. What took place in Gaza, in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, and on the streets of Israeli towns and cities does not have a single cause, but rather is the, was the convergence of multiple trends, multiple events at the same time, a kind of perfect storm, if you will. To understand the underlying causes of what took place and to discuss what should be done about them, we've convened a panel of experts I'm delighted to introduce today. First off, Yair Wallach. He's a senior lecturer in Israel studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Dr. Wallach is also the chair of the Center of Jewish Studies and a member of the Center for Palestine Studies, part of London Middle East Institute at SOAS. He received his PhD from Burbeck College in the University of London, and his dissertation looked at Arabic and Hebrew texts in the urban space of Jerusalem. Based upon this, he's the author of a recent book, A City in Fragments, Urban Text in Modern Jerusalem, which was published last year by Stanford University Press. The book explores the modern history of Jerusalem, a city overwhelmed by its religious and symbolic significance. Daniel Soberman, our second speaker, is an assistant professor of international relations at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. A former Arab affairs correspondent for Haaretz, he obtained his PhD from the Hebrew University, where his dissertation analyzed the evolution of the rules of the game between Israel and Hezbollah from the early 1990s onwards. He then spent three years as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Harvard University's Kennedy School at the Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs. And he's currently writing a book about the application and evolution of resistance in several regional conflicts, including the conflict between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. And our final and third speaker is Arij Sabahuri. She's an assistant professor of sociology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She received her doctorate at Tel Aviv University and has also held research positions at Columbia, New York, Brown and Tufts universities. Her work centers on settler colonialism, memory, gender, and the political and historical sociology of Israeli and Palestinian societies. She's co-edited two volumes entitled Palestinians in Israel, Readings in History, Politics and Society. And she has a forthcoming book under contract with Stanford University Press, which explicates the settler colonial relationship and interactions between Jewish settlers and neighboring Arab Palestinians leading to and following 1948. I'm delighted that all three of them are on the panel today and I'm looking forward to hearing their remarks. So I've invited each of them to make an opening presentation and then we'll follow up with some questions and questions from the audience. So please send us your questions and we can uh, read them uh, later on in the discussion. So without any further ado, let me now turn over to Professor Wallach. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I'll start. In in some ways, what we what we have what we had uh, in the last month is something that starts with a very very localized a point. This is the Damascus Gate and the blocking of the Damascus Gate by by police, and kind of question is how we get from something which is really quite localized to this kind of major escalation. It's not the first time. Um, in the history of the last century, that something that seems very local actually uh, escalates, and it and in some ways it's not, it's not because necessarily there's a grand plan, but because there's underlying dynamic that without these underlying dynamic and longer trajectories of change, these things could not uh, translate into major escalations. So what uh, I'll kind of uh, cover the, the main background in Jerusalem. The main background from 1967, that's um, 54 years now, 
uh, since Israeli occupation of East Jerusalem and the annexation of occupied East Jerusalem into Jerusalem, we have a situation in which the Israel, the Israeli state dominates the entire uh, uh, Jerusalem area. And we have 60% of the population in that area are Israeli Jews who have full political rights and 40% are Palestinians who have residency rather than citizenship and such have inferior legal and uh, position and, and far less political rights within that. So we have that situation of domination. We have situation of a residential segregation and we have discrimination based on the different leg legal status and other forms of legal discrimination. So it can be described as a form of urban apartheid. Now, if we think of Israeli policies vis-a-vis -vis East Jerusalem. So there's two, um, two directions here. One is the direction of exclusion, exclusionary policies, heavy handed, more repressive policies. And these are mainly around issues. And, and these are around demographic planning. I mean, the Israeli plan was to keep Palestinians and Jerusalem below 30%. That hasn't worked. They rose to 40%. But the idea is to make life as, as, as difficult as possible for the Palestinian uh, in Jerusalem in order to, to keep them under control. And that includes planning issues, housing, that includes uh, under underdeve development of East Jerusalem, very poor services, you know, and, and heavy handed policing, and more and more the uh, introduction of settler enclaves within Palestinian neighborhoods that, that create that, that uh, uh, drive out Palestinians, but also create life difficult for those that are still in the neighborhood. So that's the heavy handed side of Israeli policies. But there's also softer side of Israeli policies. And that is what's sometimes the policies of inclusion, sometimes called the Israelization. And that's because uh, policymakers understood, you know, especially in the last 15 years, that you can't do only heavy handed. You have to do also something that gives some kind of horizon. And that means mainly economic integration for Palestinians in Jerusalem and, and some developments around education that come also from uh, below. So of course there's, there's a clash between these, contradiction between these policies. You know, you create a certain expectations and of course people will not be happy just with uh, you know, more access to education or, or economic integration. They will want political rights. And that creates certain, uh, kind of creates the, the ground for the kind of um, uh, uh, resistance uprising that we saw uh, in the last month. There were two, three hotspots in this and, then, and they cover different aspects, I think, uh, of, of, of different motivations. So the first, to start with Sheikh Jarrah, which is broadly legacy issues of the conflict, but legacy issues that are very much alive and have current dynamic. So that there is, we have Jewish Israeli land claims that translate to planned evictions of Palestinian families. Palestinian families who are themselves refugees from areas that are now within Israel in 1948, but the legal discrimination means that Palestinians are unable to claim back their properties within the Green Line, while Jewish Israelis are able to claim back land and property and evict Palestinians on that basis. So you have here the legacy of 1948 and the Nakba, which translate to an ongoing process of dispossession by settlers. So this is one hotspot. The other was, um, um, Damascus Gate, which I mentioned. This is civic issues. Damascus Gate is the main civic space for Palestinians in Jerusalem, and it was blocked, cordon off by police for 11 days in, during Ramadan, which you know is about civic rights, it's about the right to the cities, it's not necessarily about history, it's about the current moment. Uh, and the last hotspot is Al-Aqsa Mosque, and following what the police understood as political mobilization, on, in Al-Aqsa, they intervened in a very heavy handed way, including uh, uh, you know, going into the mosque and firing stand grenades and so forth. There you have the religious and symbolic issues uh, that resonate very widely. So you have kind of different elements. Now, I think before what used to be the case that 
you could get mobilizations, in, at least in the last 20 years, mobilizations of Palestinians in Jerusalem were primarily on the symbolic religious, religious dimension. Now you see mobilization around symbolic religious, but also around civic, national, uh, in Damascus Gate, and around legacy and ongoing issues of connecting 48 to current disposition. All of these things are uh, uh, resulted in a very effective mobilization in, of Palestinians. The other side of it is Israeli policies. Here I don't see a, a, um, a huge change in policy, but there is escalation of certain dynamics to more heavy-handed and mainly around police, police decisions, uh, which can maybe uh, uh, arise from very tactical decisions on the ground, but are then backed up by by uh, the Israeli ministers and the Israeli government. And that combined with the backing to the settlers and back giving backing to uh, the Kahanist demonstrations, the chants, death to the Arabs, etc. This is not new, but receives more and more backing from Israeli government as a result of long-term processes and the very kind of current uh, political dynamics of the post-elections and, and coalition and so forth. Um, and I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Yair. Um, now turning over to uh, Daniel Soberman. Um, thank you, and thank you, Professor Waxman, for inviting me to this distinguished panel. Um, so I would like to make a few remarks about the origins of the last uh, uh, round of conflict, the war that just ended a, a week and a half ago. Um, and kind of give you an analysis from a strategic perspective. So I would say that um, the recent, obviously the recent 11 day confrontation was not the longest or fiercest or deadliest conflict between Israel and Hamas over the past decade and a half. But I argue that it was qualitative, qualitatively different from all previous escalations and confrontations between Israel and Hamas and the Gaza Strip. Um, let me focus on just a few points. So for the first time, Hamas actively initiated a, a conflict. Um, Hamas acknowledges as much. Uh, this is important because, first of all, this is the first time that they actually made a, st a strategic decision to uh, take a far-reaching step um, and reach almost the top of the escalation ladder between Hamas and Israel and fire rockets on Jerusalem, which they were expecting uh, as they themselves have leaked to the press, they were ex expecting this to trigger off a large scale confrontation. Um, it's interesting because this spared Hamas uh, uh, Israel's usual surprise attack and it helped it to minimize its own losses. Um, another point is, has to do with what triggered the conflict. So typically flare ups in the Gaza Strip um, were the result of the party's struggle over what both Israel and Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad refer to as the rules of the game, or the rules of, engage, of engagement. It's basically a tacit uh, language between the parties uh, that has evolved uh, over the past decade and a half at least. Um, and these rules uh, uh, basically are a practical, everyday, tacit uh, language that regulates the conflict and distinguishes tacitly acceptable behaviors from tacitly unacceptable behaviors. Now, these behaviors regulate the manner in which Israel and Hamas are uh, permitted, so-called permitted, to pursue their opposing strategic objectives uh, in terms of the strategic objectives with respect to the Gaza Strip. Israel's strategic objective, at least since Hamas's takeover in 2007, has been to maintain the blockade, uh, which Hamas refers to as a siege on the Gaza Strip. Hamas's um, strategic interest has been to remove that blockade without meeting the quartet, the, the famous uh, quartet uh, conditions of recognizing Israel and disarming. Um, for, from Hamas's standpoint, previous escalations were about the blockade and a struggle over the rules of the game. Now, this time, the conflict was not about a value that has to do with the Gaza Strip. The conflict was about Hamas's explicit attempt 
to introduce a new rule whereby Hamas is permitted to extend its deterrence beyond the Gaza Strip and harness its military power in and from the Gaza Strip in the service of coercing Israel in Jerusalem and later in the West Bank. Um, and that's a big deal because that is a, uh, there's a lot of criticism here in Israel that Israel does not have a strategy regarding the conflict with uh, the Gaza Strip and with Hamas. Uh, this is a, actually a strategic vision on the part of Hamas because this means that the recent conflict did not revolve around the siege, uh, around uh, the number of, uh, for instance, uh, the hours of, of the Gaza enjoys uh, electricity or the fishing range, the fishing zone around Gaza. No, this had to do uh, with a national value that pertains to the entire Palestinian issue. It has to do with Jerusalem. Why is that important? That's important because it has to do with, um, I would say, the, the distribution of legitimacy, authority, prestige in the entire Palestinian arena. This um, uh, recent conflagration could have far reaching implications in terms of uh, who speaks for the entire Palestinian issue. Um, so an another issue has to do with the fact that um, for the first time, I think that um, this conflict reflected the emergence of a pretty elaborate escalation ladder. It gives us a sense of what full war nowadays between Israel and Hamas looks like. Uh, it does not look like cast lead in 2008. It does not look like pillar of defense. Um, this is uh, uh, an event on a different scale. You are talking about Hamas's capability, ability together with the Palestinian Islamic Jihad mainly to unleash hundreds of rockets on Tel Aviv, on Israel's commercial capital um, daily. That is a very big deal. That is very significant. Um, and uh, maybe the last point I'd like to make is the strategic rationale of the blockade, uh, which was to prevent Hamas from turning into the quintessential second Hezbollah. So I think that this has to, um, uh, this recent conflict has to uh, lead Israel into really thinking out of the box because from an Israeli standpoint, the whole rationale, the whole strategic rationale of imposing the blockade, the siege was to prevent Hamas from becoming a second Hezbollah. Now in certain respects, Hamas is already exceeding Hezbollah's um, capabilities. Hezbollah never unleashed hundreds of rockets on, on Tel Aviv, for instance. Um, so this is definitely something that Israel must bring into consideration. Consideration, Again, I am focusing here only on strategic aspects. Um, and um, uh, I, will, I will have a few more uh, um, points to make, but I'll probably make them uh, later on in the discussion. Don't want to uh, take up too much of uh, your time. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, and now, uh, Arij. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks though for inviting me. Speaking now as a political and a historical sociologist, I wish to offer two short remarks on the most recent visible crisis. First, Palestinian citizens in Israel, especially those living in the so-called mixed cities, have found themselves in an early situation similar to the capricious Israeli military rule period that lasted from 48 until 66. In that historical moment, the Israeli state granted citizenship to the remaining Palestinians, a population already decimated by the Nakba, while concurrently curtailing their rights, establishing judicial revenues for the further disposition of their homes, suppressing their capacity to resist and punishing those who attempted to return. Just decades earlier, Zionist settlers had first arrived to Palestine, not to eliminate. They, many of them refugees, came to install their sovereignty in a homeland for the Jews. But their practices 
did take eliminatory functions for the local inhabitants. Jumping back to 48, the early state years were the very moment in which the relationship between the newly sovereign Israel state and the Palestinian citizens first took on its character. This moment certainly was not the inception of coexistence. It entailed the imposition of hierarchized citizenship, the enforcement of advanced marginality, the invention, the invention and apprehension by Zionist and Jewish Israeli of Palestinians as socially other, and their desovernization. A state of emergency was declared, which enabled a coercive state apparatus to enact its sovereignty through converting resistant Palestinian indigenous inhabitants to internal enemy citizens, criminalizing their political struggle and stripping down their subjectivity to bear life. The state of emergency is continuous and indeed has re resurfaced in the violent proceedings of the past weeks. The enduring disposition of Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem instantiate the perpetuation of colonization, not by the state directly, by settler citizens group backed by state power and emboldened by its Jabotinskian right-wing leaders. We have seen this Judaization and creeping land confiscation processes before across the Zionist movement and Israeli state histories, especially in 48 and 67. In the geographies like the, the Galil and the Naqab, settler colonialism is not unified, substantive, substantive entity. It consists of many folds, agents, desires, and mechanisms. And the recent attacks on Palestinian citizens in Lid and other mixed cities by Jewish Israeli settler citizens demonstrate how the frontier remain open as a place to conquer and exclude. These very cities where violence has sprouted recently have been the manifestation of the project of disposition and elimination through surveillance, economic suppression, separation, and lawfare. Unfortunately, the recent crisis identified in the title of today's panel is nothing new. It may have been made invisibilized to some, but it's a reflection of the continuity of settler colonial crisis. If we aim to understand the roots of the current crisis, we should remember that the context of the relation between Israel and the Palestinian citizens is rooted in the history of the inception of the Israeli state. Israel, as a colonial state, has grasped a claim to the monopoly on violence, no less through its vast military apparatus. It first accumulated this capacity by enacting violence upon an indigenous population it didn't see as part of the Jewish national ethnos. Leaders of the state wanted to eliminate these natives as natives. This has been the root of all subsequent asymmetry. There has been no parity, nor two sides on an even playing field. The Israeli state and some of its settler citizens have been waging war against the Palestinians. The monopoly on violence has been shaped by the collusion of a state and Jewish settler citizens uh, in a settler colonial relation. I mean by this to identify how citizen subjects have been a recruited by the Israeli state in the project of land appropriation and accumulation, b became implicated in the maintenance of violence through compulsory military service, and c actively perpetrated violence. In the case of the last events, it's crucial to refer to the words of the Minister of Public Security, Amir Ohana, relating to the settler, to the Mitnachel, that killed a Palestinian citizen in Lid. Quote, law-abiding citizens carrying weapons are force multiplier in the hands of the authorities for the immediate neutralization of threat and danger. 
end of quote. Importantly today, the state grasp on power is feasible only through conditions of coercion, separation, and political violence. Because otherwise, the maintenance of asymmetry would be un unthinkable. But Palestinians and the very few Jewish Israelis who have allied with them have for decades been imagining what a different configuration of a state and society could be, a decolonized one. This leads me to, sec to my second point. Palestinians have been and to continue to organize and resist. On May 18, Palestinian citizens in Israel for the first time initiated a strike that spread to the occupied Palestinian territories, to the refugee camps, and across the diaspora. They went on strike to protest the disposition in Sheikh Jarrah, the attacks at Al-Aqsa, in the end in the mixed cities and the brutality in Gaza and against the enduring assaults of, on Palestinian life. Gaza is not the beginning of this story and the striking Palestinian across the territory recognize this much. They are struggling with all other Palestinians for their existence and dignity. The main popular protest we have seen has not led has not been led by the political leaders. It has been a grassroots effort led by the Palestinian citizens of Israel, mainly by the younger generation, which are reunited the dispersed Palestinian in, the mass for, in, the, in this mass format for one of the first time since 36. The Palestinians have formed popular and emergency committees to assemble resistant praxis. They have used poetry, art, and literature to express the otherwise inexpressible. Palestinians lack formal territorial sovereignty and the infra infrastructure to support themselves, but they creatively engage and practice through popular, social, and political struggle alternative and alternative epistemologies. We must develop sharper sharper conception of agency vis-a-vis -vis the state of emergency, because the imposition of bare life is not and never has been accepted from below. We require no sociological terms to work with the acknowledgement that agency is not theoretical, it's practiced on the ground. A testimony written by the Palestinian feminist activist Samah Salaimi reflects some of the conditions of the livability of Palestinians in led during the events. Quote, I visit the burned and destroyed homes of citizens and children in Eid clothes were playing among the ashes in complete innocence and talking about gas bombs and night settler attacks as they were adventures in a computer game. In the Hinawi family in the old city, more than 15 children learned about the meaning of Molotov cocktails and the M16 refile that settlers carry while attacking them at night. In the Qaddura family, a 14-year-old boy was shot by a police and he is now detained and has not received proper treatment. In front of the mosque and the church, guard shifts and an eight guard shifts and an eight center. Tamir Nafar, a Palestinian singer, is in a state of national and artistic mobilization in defense of his family and the inhabitants of the, his city. Fida Hadi, a political activist and a member of the city council, is busy dealing with the arrest of young people. In the community center, the headquarters of the humanitarian aid was open, full of human provisions and energies. The women and young women are working relentlessly with youth in the factory of the goodness. We must not al khair. End of quote. Samah may be reflecting on a human tragedy here, but what she really identifies is a different form of popular existence. The organization of care in the face of state abandonment and assault. She recounts not only the imagining of a different kind of world, but the enacting of it through emergency committees, resilience, and mutual aid. 
Palestinians are not asking for a return to normal. To return to normality is to return to the formation of the Jewish and democratic state, to the nation state law, to structural discrimination against Palestinian citizens, to the occupation, to Gaza siege, and to a form of sociality where the lives of millions of Palestinians are controlled and governed by a settler state. This is the normality that liberal discourse is seeking because it means the privileges of those implicated in settler colonialism, primarily Ashkenazi Jews as, con as continued profiters remain untouched. Meanwhile, the Palestinian population will continue to live under ongoing violence in its different forms, ongoing emergency and domination, intermittent phases of breaking the silence, though it's inadequate. A representative survey concluded by Madal Carmel, the Arab Center for, uh, for Applied Social Research in the past week, reflects the main reasons for Palestinian citizens' mobilization and popular protest through their lenses. The results showed that 57% of the Palestinian citizens said that the, the incidents in Al-Aqsa and Sheikh Jarrah stood as the reason for the uprising. 18% said it was the police apathy and neglect toward internal violence. And 17% responded discrimination against Palestinian citizens in every aspect is the main reason. What is reflected here is the struggle against oppressive state practices, and for many, struggle against the ongoing Nakba of 1948, wherein Palestinian continue to people themselves, to other Palestinian, united by the collective feeling of subjugation and colonization. To conclude, this moment, like the ones that came before, poses a dialectical orientation. This moment contains the seeds of two possible futures, one is very hopeful, is that of decolonization, unification between the fractured Palestinians, popular resistance without predatory leadership, and the potential to install equality between all people in Israel-Palestine, Palestinian and Jews together. But second, the seeds are being sown for another potential ethnic cleansing not seen in mass scale since the 1948 Nakba for those who remained in the 1949 armistice borders. And this is why we must pay attention to the state of emergency. If we ask what it means to be indigenous, it is precisely to hold a material subject position always threatened by possible expulsion, disposition, and elimination. For Palestinian, and for me in this case, this fear is not theoretical, but lived out each day. This state of emergency, the state of emergency is continuous. My hope is that I have passed along to you even a sliver of the second side to use the both terminology that my phenomenological position enables in, in analyzing a crisis, inviting you to articulate, demand, and organize an alternative future. Thank you. Thank you, Arish. Um, okay, so now um, I want to encourage uh, members of our audience to continue to send in questions, and we will turn to those questions in just a minute. But I want to turn back uh, to, to all of the panelists uh, to ask, I mean, you've all spoken about the underlying causes for the, the recent escalation uh, of violence. So I, want to, I want to turn attention now to what impact this escalation has had upon those courses. I know we're only two weeks away, so obviously uh, there is, um, you know, not uh, not much time to assess this. But we already see, you know, what's changed, if anything, in East Jerusalem, or is is there a different? Uh, is there now a debate or a discussion in 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 Israel about uh, Palestinians in East Jerusalem about the policing decisions there? Um, similarly, when it comes to Israel and Hamas. Uh, is there what what has shifted, if anything, in terms of that discussion? And and the same, and I'm going to turn to you, Arij, about Palestinian citizens 
uh, of Israel and, and how the recent events have uh, impacted the community. You've already touched upon this. So let me begin uh, with Yair. If you could say something, how do you think uh, what's taken place in recent weeks will have changed any of the dynamics that you've discussed or do they only reinforce those, those pre-existing dynamics? Okay, I mean, there's, there's contradictory dynamics at play. Uh, one thing is that uh, just now there's, uh, there was a report that was launched in uh, Van Leer last week, written by two scholar uh, researchers, activists. One is uh, 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 the scholar Marek Stern and Aviv uh, Tatavsky on, on measures that are that don't solve the political problem, but address the acute uh, discrimination against Palestinian and Jerusalem. Um, and these ideas have been going on for quite a while. You know, it's mainly around planning issues um, and policing. And they come from below, they come from non-state actors, they, they come from Palestinians, they come from Israeli groups, BIMCOM and, you know, and various other groups that say, okay, you know, this is, we're not seeing any kind of breakthrough in the political terms. And so, but, but it can't be a situation that people can't build homes, you know, it's kind of, and these have some resonance, I think in some poly, some policy circles in Israel, but the, uh, the limits have been quite clear. I mean, the, the planning is constrained because of political uh, considerations. Uh, um, so, so it's, it's, um, you can't escape a big question. The big question is political rights, I think, and that, that is inescapable. Uh, you know, to have a situation in which the capital city of Israel, 40% of the population are residents, not citizens, it's not, you know, it, it, it creates, uh, you know, problems that, that are, Will not be resolved by goodwill. It's 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 uh, it's, it's goodwill is not enough. There is, there is goodwill and badwill, but uh, but goodwill is not enough. It, it requires a change in the political situation, which is not forthcoming. Um, um, the other side of it is the, I think the dynamic of the post elections and the looming government created an interest for what elements in the right wing to escalate the situation. Because the decision of Naftali Bennett to form a government with Palestinian partners, he is vulnerable. And they understand that there's room to, there, there's voters out there that, that, uh, that, that can go to their, so they will have, uh, they have a very clear interest to escalate and to put the Bennett government in a predicament because to prove that it's a leftist government. So, and they will want to prove that they're not a leftist government. This will escalate things. So the potential is there. Um, and, and that's, you know, uh, it, it will be interesting to see how this played is out. The challenge from the right wing is gonna be there. There are room to, you know, if the new government comes in, the police portfolio is in the hand of a labor minister. We'll see what this comes. I mean, this is the Zionist left. Do they, you know, do they see the need for de-escalation? There's room for change there. We will see about that. It's it's uh, it's clear that there's room for for lowering the the, the, the pressure on Israel in that sense. But I would say I think, I mean, to carry on from comments by Arrange, and I think that you know, um, uh, and I think that, that that's, and I think I mean there are lots to unpack in Arrange's comment and, and Daniel's as well. But I think where I where Arrange highlighted continuity, uh, and I would emphasize, uh, and I think I agree with that. But I emphasize also change. I think that you know the settler effort. 20 years ago was directed at the occupied territories. And they won. It's a one-state reality. Now their effort is directed inwards. 
That's where I see the change towards the mixed cities. That's where this, because they won already. The, the, the West Bank has been effectively annexed. And that's the reality, the one state reality that we live and in which Jerusalem assumes a very important place as a kind of place where you cannot escape these questions. You have occupations, you have integration, you have all of this at the same place. And I think what I agree very much with Arish is that, you know, we, we on the one hand, we see mobilization, very interesting thing, but the one set reality also brings back the possibility of, uh, of um, ethnic cleansing on a mass scale in a way that we haven't been since 67 or 48. And I think if Trump was still in the White House, we would see this round of escalation going uh, far, far worse. I think we have to uh, be aware of that. The danger is there and there's a lot, not many constraints to hold the Israeli white wing if they choose to go in the direction, you know, and, and, and that is something that we have to be aware of. It's not theoretical. I'll stop here. Thank you, yeah. Just a quick follow-up question since you mentioned uh, the, the danger of far-right extremists trying to, you know, provoke violence or a crisis in order to test the new, maybe new Bennett Lapid government. Um, do you, do you, you, you in, in the run-up to, the, in the lead-up to uh, the, the violence that broke out, there was, of course, the march through central Jerusalem by, you know, La Hava activists and La Familia and some of these kind of, you know, far-right activists, uh, or thugs who have, you know, been terrorizing uh, Palestinians in the streets of Jerusalem for some time. That wasn't any. Do you see that? Do you see their activities as strategic in this sense, as as not just you know another right wing demonstration by kind of soccer hooligans and 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 you know far right extremists, but but that that there is actually. Um, a kind of deliberate attempt to, first of all, set back the progress that had been made in Jewish-Palestinian relations by creating this escalation. Um, and then also, you know, uh, Itamar ben Gvir, a new Knesset member going to Sheikh Jarrah as well. How do you see those actions? Were they strategic, deliberate? Is this uh, an actor that we have to pay more attention to, particularly in the context of Jerusalem? I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think very much so. I mean, I think the, you know, the, I think they understand the struggle on the nature of the one state. They have created a single state through, uh, you know, I mean, you know, long story, but we've reached in this situation that is a one state reality and and it's, we don't see a, you know, we don't see a, change that. So they said that it's a start, what kind of state is it? And in that sense, they hit the weakest or the most symbolic points. I think that's the, and for them, you know, that's why Palestinian citizens of Israel present such a threat because they, uh, you know, any empowerment, any equality of Palestinian citizens could translate to equality for Palestinians also in the occupied territory. So, it means that the struggle has, has on, on, on idea of blatant um, structure, blatant principle of Jewish Israeli supremacy that has to be enforced and, and pushed through this kind of, through these kinds of, uh, um, uh, you know, provocative, you know, marches and so forth. And the discourse in these marches is genocidal. I think we have to say that. Now, this course does not always translate into action, but it could. And this is persistent. It's not, you know, it's not one off. There's a genocidal discourse in these uh, events that, and it's very clearly focused because they see as the kind of the, the kind of the battlegrounds are places like the, the uh, Temple Mount Ham Sharif, kind of the, the where Palestinians still enjoy um, control and, and certain kind of symbolic sovereignty that has to be uprooted because no form of Palestinian sovereignty can be allowed. And places like Sheikh Jarrah, where 
Palestinians resist eviction. And that's kind of a test case for the possibility of continued dispossession. That's why the focus is on places like these because they see them as a kind of test grounds and, and symbolic uh, uh, places that could translate to wider uh, dynamic. Now, this is not new, but it's been growing and growing in terms of, of, of resonance and, and place. Thank you. Um, now, Daniel, let me ask you, um, you, you talked about the, the, uh, how in this recent round of fighting, uh, the rules of the game had changed between Israel and, and Hamas. And, and so do you see, uh, since this round has ended, a attempt to return to a rules of the game or restore rules of the game or redefine them? Or, or is there perhaps um, an, uh, an inclination, very small inclination, to move beyond this, uh, this framework and to try to think about, about a different way of engaging, not, so, not one relate, uh, based upon you know, this strategy of deterrence and containment on Israel's part. Um, so I want to ask you about that. I also want to pose a couple of questions that come in from our audience. Um, one question comes from Robert Turner. Uh, this is a broader question about Hamas's evolution and whether you think Hamas can evolve from being a terrorist organization to an organization that abandons that, like he gives the example of the Ilgun. Um, so, you know, or, or, or you know, mo most famously, you could also talk about the PLO. Um, so do you see that evolution uh, um, as, a, as, as occurring? Um, or is it possible? And another question, and I'm going to just put these, grouping these together on the questions that have come in about um, Hamas, um, concerns, you know, the international reaction to the re recent violence and how you see that. Do you think that um, there's a unwillingness in the international community to recognize Hamas's role in, um, for example, you know, in its strategy of firing rockets from subpopulated areas where there's many civilians, preventing civilians, uh, according to the question, from uh, leaving those areas, which may be then subject to Israeli retaliation. Um, so do you think, that in, in terms of how you read the international community's understanding of these, uh, this violence between Israel and Hamas, is, is it fundamentally misguided? Is there a fundamentally misunderstanding about what's really happening? Or do you think uh, the international community is able to recognize fairly accurately what, um, what's been taking place? Okay, so uh, first of all, I don't think we have honestly enough uh, perspective. It's only been two weeks to be talking about the evolution of the rules of the game between, between Israel and Hamas since the ceasefire took uh, hold. Um, the one thing we need to, to understand about the, these rules of the game, and again, both parties refer to uh, this language as rules of the game or rules of engagement, is that this is the basically the it's the language that regulates the everyday conflict while they are both sides are um, pursuing their opposing strategic objectives. Now it's it's incredibly important to stress that what Hamas has been trying to do, this might have more impact on Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem than any other thing that uh, has been raised here. Uh, I do not have the answer. No one has, has the answer yet. But from Hamas's perspective, the goal was to change the rules of the game in a way that would legitimize, quote unquote, its using of its military prowess in the Gaza Strip to coerce Israel beyond the Gaza Strip and what is called extended deterrence, right? To extend its deterrence, its military power in the Gaza Strip and use it to threaten Israel um, in other arenas. Uh, for instance, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. So one thing that Hamas has come out of this uh, recent uh, conflagration, recent uh, escalation, confrontation, war, um, uh, is the rule that from now on, the equation is that every time Israel escalates in East Jerusalem, we will be entitled to use our rockets from the Gaza Strip 
to deter Israel or coerce Israel into ending that behavior. Now, in a sense, from an Israeli perspective, this uh, recent war clash was basically about this, was whether Jerusalem was fair game between Israel and Hamas, um, or is Jerusalem beyond the scope of anything that happens in the dynamic between Israel and the Gaza Strip? This remains to be seen because it could very well be the case that next time something big happens in East Jerusalem, Hamas will at least at a minimum um, threaten to use its rockets. Um, and even if it does not threaten to use its rockets from the Gaza Strip, the question is whether Israel from now on needs to bring in um, Hamas's capabilities in the Gaza Strip into its calculations uh, with respect to its behavior in other arenas? That's a big question. We do not have an answer to this yet, but Hamas insists that they have changed the rules of the game in a sense that in a way that allows them to uh, throw their weight uh, and join the fray, if you will, next time something happens in Jerusalem. Uh, this could be a recipe for uh, another protracted uh, conflict between Israel and Hamas, because uh, obviously Israel, from Israel's perspective, it can't let this happen. Um, in terms of Hamas's evolution, then one thing I think is that is useful to understand that every organization, every organization has a life cycle. Um, and in terms of Hamas, this is one thing that is, uh, um, many Israelis have a hard time understanding is that Hamas is basically where, um, um, where the, the Zionist movement, let's put it this way, was in 1948. So this is an asymmetry that, because they are fighting for their factorhood, independence, they are trying to elbow they, their way into an existing strategic environment, and they are up against uh, established actors that are way more powerful than they are. Um, and what is at stake is, is the Palestinian issue. Um, so they are in a stage in terms of their um, where there are in, in, in the life cycle of an organization where they are a lot more willing to um, the balance of resolve in a sense favors them. Let's put it that way. Um, there, so I think that there is definitely, um, you know, I see in their trajectory, yes, they will evolve, they will, um, and there are th things by the way that Israel can do in order to precipitate this and to accelerate this process, which I think has benefits for, from an Israeli point of view. For instance, give them what to lose. You know, the IDF has been for, for, for quite a few years now trying to push uh, for really thinking, apropos thinking out of, the, you know, out of the box and pushing the envelope about how do we prevent the next, the next uh, catastrophic war uh, in the Gaza Strip? And one way is just you know, throw money at them, give them, you know, give them, improve the life in the Gaza Strip, uh, establish assets, values, strategic values in the Gaza Strip, like Hezbollah has in Lebanon, and 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 give them what to lose. Um, honestly, Palestinians living in and the I mean, high-ranking people in the IDF will say as exactly this. They do not have that much to lose in the Gaza Strip, which is why um, they are willing to, to enter into rounds of conflict over uh, fishing, uh, over electricity, over you know, everyday life. Um, I think that would, uh, from a strategic point of view, I think that would actually benefit the situation and introduce more stability to the situation even from a, you know, from a practical military point of view, Israel will have more to threaten Hamas with. Um, and in terms of the international community, look, Israel is a, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm focusing about the, uh, on the Israeli aspect here, obviously, this is not belittling anything that is happening in the Gaza Strip. 
but Israel is finds itself in a in a in really in a predicament where the 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 weaker party um, in the Gaza Strip has um, resorted to basically guerrilla operations. Now, guerrilla, if you read Mao Zedong, it's all about the fish, you know, a fish in its own water, right? So they act and they operate from their own, you know, from their own, within their own population. That's what guerrilla is about. Um, and in that sense, there is almost, you know, by definition, the, um, uh, uh, the costs on the Palestinian population in the Gaza Strip are inherently going to be catastro catastrophic, um, and this is this is one thing that uh, um, Israel has been really s struggling with. I, um, you know, I don't think there are many people um, um, in Israel who enjoy. Seeing these uh, pictures of, of you know dozens of dead Palestinian children in Gaza, um, but on the, on the other hand, um, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with a military strategy that purposefully um, uses uh, civilian areas as its area of operation. Um, how do you deal with this? Um, this is, um, the situation is very hairy, very difficult to begin with. Um, I personally do not, I'm not sure that I have the, the answers. Well, if you come up with any, uh, do let us know. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Arish, uh, I want to ask you a question, and then we've had some questions from the audience as well. My question, you talked about, you mentioned this survey um, of um, the, what was driving the recent protests by Palestinian citizens of Israel, and that the majority, a slight majority, had said Sheikh Jarrah, um, what was happening in Sheikh Jarrah and on Al-Aqsa, uh, I was thinking of the um, what's referred to as the uh, events of October 2000, which was another time of mass protest, mass mobilization by Palestinian citizens of Israel, uh, which led to the deaths of 13 uh, Palestinians, 12 c Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, and uh, that, 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 those demonstrations were widely explained as a result not of it's true that they, it happened immediately after the beginning of the Second Intifada, but they were explained really as a result of the neglect, the discrimination, uh, the long-standing issues that had faced Palestinian citizens. But in other words, it was not really about the Second Intifada, but rather about the status of Palestinians in Israel. It seems this time around, maybe that's different. I wonder, is this generation today out on the streets? We, different in some ways, therefore, than what was described as the stand tall generation, the generation of Palestinians, your own generation, perhaps, who, who were out in, in, in that earlier era. Is there a difference today for a young generation of Palestinians, citizens of Israel, than those who were involved in the events of October 2000? So that's me. Uh, the questions that have come in, uh, I'll, I'll group them, I, I want a couple, one was uh, one is asking about um, whether the um, the inconclusive Israeli election, the cycle of Israeli elections, um, whether that played a role, and and particularly, you know, the mention the possibility um, through these election cycles, first of all, of the joint list, um, you know, supporting Gantz, and then more recently of United Arab list. Uh, now entering into this coalition. How does this politics, Israeli domestic politics, impact the attitudes, the, the actions of Palestinian citizens of Israel now? And, and I guess, and, and you know, d does, do you think, and, and how, as by extension of that, will the inclusion of Ram in this, in this, you know, uh, emerging coalition government, if it, if it is um, supported by the Knesset, how, if anything, will that change things? Or do you think really, you know, having an Arab party in the 
in the governing coalition won't fundamentally change the kind of dynamics that you've been describing. Uh, thank you, Doug, for this important question. Um, I will start answering this by, uh, by corresponding with uh, Yair's uh, comment about uh, the change or the continuation of this emergency situation and etc. And I find myself, Yair, accept with you that there, there is a change. There, the, the change is in the uh, different practices and the manifestation of the structure of disposition and discrimination. I'm not talking about a continuous you know, structure, but rather a structure that is transforming, that is engaging different forces and new liberal uh, uh, forces that entering here, even in the practices of a, a settlement in Sheikh Jarrah and other. And if we um, if we look through what's going in Sheikh Jarrah, we can understand. We can we should connect it with the practices of settlement in the occupied Palestinian territories and who is sponsoring the settlements there and the combination between the state apparatus and internationally global uh, 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 apparatus, which includes, for example, rich Jews, global uh, Jews from, uh, if you heard about Kohelet, for example. So why I'm mentioning this, Yair? Because I agree with you that settler colonialism and the disposition of Palestinian is taking different forms, but the core is the displacement of Palestinians wherever they uh, live. And this is the core issue that I'm talking about, but I completely agree with you. There, there are transformations of the way, and let's, let's talk it, let's talk about it. Israel today is a sovereign state. The, the practices of colonization in the West Bank it's different than what happened before 48 and specifically with the declaration of the Israeli sovereignty. This is first. Uh, Dov, about the, the, um, the surveys in 2000s and now, I don't know about which surveys uh, that are you talking about in 2000s. There is a, an inclination in Israeli a, a scholarship to uh, conceal indirectly what is the core of the conflict? And this is um, epistemological, if I can uh, call it blindness, that to, to make it safer for yourself, you would, to, not you, but generally the Jewish society in Israel, and I am a sociologist, it's easier to solve it in, uh, and, and articulate the different popular protests by discrimination and budgets and etc., without talking about the core issue. And what I see as the connection between the different protests and the different intifadas and where they are, uh, um, uh, um, where there are crises, this crisis starts with the practices of settlement. In 2000s, with the broke of the Intifada in the West Bank and Jerusalem. And now what's going on on Sheikh Jarrah is the continuation of the evacuation of Palestinians. Now, if we want to relate about the case of Jewish property in East Jerusalem, and if the Palestinians own the property which uh, they live in now, without the historical context of who are these Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan? And Yair, you talked about Silwan. One of my students in the Hebrew University is from Silwan, is now under the threat of evacuation or of expulsion. And this is this question is related to, to, to the general. This is why I'm trying to connect to the roots of this conflict, because if we are not connecting, we will always miss 
the point, which is that the, the, the people who are now living in Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah, they are mostly refugees from different cities, from Jerusalem itself, from Jaffa, from Lid, from other places. So the, these, uh, this population was uh, uh, displaced and now they are witnessing a different kind of displacement through private companies, right? So uh, those, again, the connections between 2000s and today is the, 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 the line that is connecting the collective protest, which is to protect your existence in this place where you're living, in what it's called mixed cities, in, uh, in other Palestinian even villages, and, and Yair, again, the process of a Judaization in the Galil and in Naqab, if we look what happened in Al Araqib, for how many times this village was uh, uh, demolished, this is the continuation that I'm talking about. This is the, the, the thing that if we analyze the crisis and the conflict as it is uh, international, and, uh, as, as it is between two states, we are talking about Hamas and Israel as we are talking about two states. I think this, is, this analysis will, um, will not help us understand the core issues of this livability of where what is what it means for Palestinian to live in Israel and what it means for a Jewish people or a Jewish uh, person to live in Israel. It means that if you are a Jewish, you are privileged in privilege in your access to the land and privilege. And I, uh, I, uh, I think you should listen to this very carefully. You would be privileged to be protected by the police if you are attacked by Arab. But if you are a Palestinian, you won't have the possibility of protection if you are attacked by a settler or by a citizen settler, because the police and we have many, many testimonies that show and videos that shows how it started with attacks from uh, 1967 settlers coming to the uh, mixed cities, attacking Palestinian and the police would come and protect and back up the settlers. So this situation, this um, inequality is, is articulated in the very existence, in the daily existence. And it is reflected very clearly in this crisis. But, the, but this the, the kind of living under continuous threat, again, as I mentioned in my talk, it's not theoretical. In some places, you are afraid to talk Arabic because of the possibility of being attacked. So I think this is important to tackle. And again, again, we should extract our knowledge from the positionality of the occupied and the, the oppressed, and also from, from the, the idea that just talking about Israel right to exist without the talking about how Israel is transfor transforming the, and making the Jewish existence in Palestine insecure. And this, this is the important question that we should raise how we can turn, and Dov, you might ask me also in a, an email conversation, how we can transform these relations. This relation can be transformed if we open up even the media in Israel. And here is another risk, uh, another risky component that the international, uh, uh, international community should be aware of. There is some specific uh, characteristic of the Israeli society that I doubt if it, uh, it exists in other societies in conflict. The Israeli society, they just listen to the Hebrew media, mostly. While Palestinian, for example, could navigate between the Arabic and the Hebrew media, the Israeli just hear one thing. And the media 
was involved in different formation. In this crisis, I, it's unfortunate that we can share here testimonies from uh, journalists, from, uh, 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 um, from people in the media, how they would talk to Palestinians as if they were commanders or soldiers. And this is another component because this sustain the conscious of fear among Israelis that they are attacked without the possibility of being exposed to a different position, a different, uh, a different understanding of the ongoing, and this will regenerate this fear of the Israelis. So, can I just ask quickly um, on in terms of the current, in terms of the uh, you know the new the new government that might come in? Do you think? I mean, Mansour Abbas has been all over the media, Israeli media, um, you know, and many commentators have noted that that's one of the significant developments. First of all, having, um, you know, his voice regularly. Um, but do you think, uh, do you look at this in a positive way? Are you hopeful that this will change the dynamics? I mean, many people have ex argued that the rise of his party, the, the support for it, um, was because Palestinians were focusing in Israel, not on so much what was happening in, in the West Bank or in Gaza or in East Jerusalem, but rather on, you know, the issue, the crime in, in, in Arab areas inside Israel and their concerns. So there was a shift. So, so it seems to be two different understandings. On the one hand, there's this, you know, uh, a wider consciousness, and yet you see the rise of a party very explicitly saying, you know, we're really going to bracket those issues. Um, so how do you think uh, Mansour Abbas and, and the United Arab List and their participation is changing anything? Can it change anything? Um, what does this say about the, the situation today? Uh, thank you, Dov, again. I don't think that the, the existence of uh, and the participation of uh, Mansour Abbas in this government will transform the situation that I'm talking about. It's something that might give some uh, opportunistic Palestinian Arabs inside Israel more uh, economic opportunities. But I think the, 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 um, the way the, uh, um, the Arab list were excluded, it, despite the recommendation on Gans and others, and the vision, the joint list proposed, which is the vision of equality, of transforming this existence of the two communities was not accepted. Now, I, I even would, would uh, see this a step in the future as as proposing another risk, which is, which is the collision between a Muslim Israeli trend, a Muslim religious Israeli trend with a, a, an Israeli right-wing religious trend that might create a different, a, a different um, you know, interaction, but it is, it would be more dangerous than uh, the possibility of not being incorporated in the Israeli government. Incorporation and cooperation with the kind of government, while Mansour Abbas is not talking, is not bringing his identity and his audience identity, is, I think, the core problem because you are justifying through this step the continuation of the same processes of the Israeli state against its Palestinian citizens. So I am, up, unfortunately, I'm not optimistic about this. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, let me let me turn to you. We've had some questions coming in um, about the um, the issue in Sheikh Jarrah and the um, you know the legal case. Um, 
And I think there's some kind of confusion about, about this. People have heard all sorts of conflicting stories about the Palestinian families, you know, uh, do they, uh, their legal rights, who the tenants are, who's that dispute. Can you just kind of maybe unpack some of this, particularly some of the misconceptions that I'm sure you've heard about this issue? I mean, um, in terms of what's really behind this, you, you, you mentioned this before in, in terms of larger Israeli policy. Um, but if you could say a little bit more about the, the, in, this issue in Sheikh Jarrah um, and whether you think there's a way of resolving this. I mean, this issue is, uh, the, I'm, I'm speaking specifically about the, the, the possible uh, likely eviction of these Palestinian families from their homes. Is this, is the Supreme Court has, you know, delayed the hearing on the case, but sooner or later it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back. And the law as currently stands is one that would probably mean that the Supreme Court will rule in favour of the uh, petitioners, the, um, the people who are trying, the, the individuals who hold these property titles. Um, is there a way out of this? Is there a way to, 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 to deal with this? Or is this something that is just part and parcel of this broader uh, contradictory policies uh, towards Jerusalem? Yeah. I think it's first, before going to the details, it's very important to zoom out and repeat what I said earlier. We have a situation in which, by law, Jewish Israelis can claim back properties in East Jerusalem and West Bank that were in Jewish hands before 48. They, can, they have a right of return to these properties. Palestinians do not have, even if they live in Jerusalem, which is part of Israel according to Israeli law, they do not have a right to claim back their properties. I think that's, that's the basic discrimination. Uh, you know, um, so we can go into the details, but be, above all this is a basic fundamental discrimination. The second thing is that, of course, according to international law, Israelism is occupied territory. It's not part of Israel. And therefore, removing local population, protected population, is against international law. Again, it's very clear. Of course, Israeli courts uh, treat it as if it's part of Israel. The details are, are that um, you had two Jewish or several, uh, several Jewish endowment neighborhoods there um, before 48. Um, Mizrahi Jews of various groups lived there. It was a very poor neighborhood. They were pushed out in 1948, lost their properties, uh, given properties uh, of Palestinians in West Jews. None of these people are actually the, uh, um, the people that claim back the, the, the land. It's the ownership was bought not from them, but from the endowment, the, 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 the Jewish endowment, and so, and so forth. It's, it's a complicated. But none of the original inhabitants is a Jewish inhabitants that trying to go back. That's also important to say. So what we have here is a settler group that took over from the original endowment and is claiming back. There's a legal case that based on uh, the Palestinians' families say that they were misled by lawyers in the 80s, that they that there a sudden compromise was reached behind their backs that they were not aware of and against their will and so forth. As you say, the, the courts accepted the settlers came so far. And once they've accepted, accepted the ownership of the settlers, it's very hard to see how they can, you know, they can, of course, they can find legal reasons why why this is uh, wrong, but they've not went this way so far. The suggest there are still ways for the government to intervene if it wishes. I mean, one this is suggested by uh, someone who was born and grew up in the neighborhood, Michael Ben Yair, who, who was the uh, um, um, state attorney later. And he said, well, the government can expropriate the, the, ter the, the land and give it to the Palestinians if they want to solve it. You know, there's various things that you can do if you want to solve it rather than give it to the settlers. 
I don't know. I mean, I think we'll probably see more and more delays. I think that the courts will try to escape these situations. The end, but it's 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 a you know it's an um, you know it's 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 a hot potato that will, they will try to somehow or, or kind of push uh, further. The fundamental question is: if Jews have a right of return to these properties, then it does not make sense to prevent that right from Palestinians. I mean, if you, and if you, you know, and, and, and these are refugees fighting for their second home, not for their original homes. They're fighting for the homes that they got in the 50s. Thank you. Um, now, uh, Daniel, um, turning back to the Israel Hamas uh, fighting, um, questions have come in about, you know, how, if at all, the signing of the so-called Abraham Accords, the normalization agreements between Israel and the UAE and Bahrain and Maurice and then Morocco and Sudan. Did this shift Hamas's uh, strategy in, a, in any way? Was this a factor in, in Hamas's thinking? And related, somewhat related to that, so this is a, a separate question, I'm going to add it on, um, about Iran's role in all of this. I mean, we talked about Israel and Hamas as these two actors, but of course Hamas also has uh, received arms and um, funding from Iran. And uh, I, I read a report recently which suggested that Iran or the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and Hezbollah were even involved on the day-to-day -day operational basis. There was a, a joint war room. Um, so can you say something about Iran's involvement of this? What does that uh, which Hamas has acknowledged that there was this war room. I mean, does this was this a coordination of attacks? Is this a, a new level of Iranian involvement in uh, in in its support for Hamas in terms of actually being involved on the on the day to day um, decision making? Okay, so I think the way to answer both these questions and to, is to really zoom out and explain what is hap what has been happening in the Middle East. Um, which is a, on a geopolitical level, is a contest, is a conflict between two competing regional orders. One of them is a regional order that relates to uh, the peace process, diplomacy. Uh, it is backed by the US. It relates to, uh, in a sense, uh, to the West. Israel is part of that uh, order. Uh, the Abraham Accords, uh, Israel's um, improving relations with Saudi Arabia. These are all elements, these are all manifestations of um, the, I would say, the emergence of a more coherent um, block or camp, regional camp, which is on one side of the geopolitical fault line. On the other side of the geopolitical fault line, we find what is widely referred to as the Iranian or the Iranian-backed uh, regional camp or uh, the self-described axis of resistance, Mehwar um, al-Muqawama, which Hamas relates to. I am not arguing that Hamas is an integral part of, uh, or not yet at least, of that um, regional camp, but it does share the basic value uh, viewing Israel, viewing the United States, viewing Western intervention in this area, in this neighborhood, as uh, basically as colonial, um, you know, remnants of colonialism. Um, and the, the Iranian camp comes with a certain model. The model is called resistance. Now, resistance represents many things. It represents a culture. It represents a culture that views Israel and the United States as illegitimate in this in this area in the Middle East. Um, but it also comes with a uh, with a model, with a with a, an asymmetrical um, strategic model for fighting um, uh, asymmetric wars or asymmetric conflicts with actors that are a lot more powerful than you are. Now, in this respect, there is a strategic community that has been evolving in the, in the region. And Hamas is definitely part of that strategic community. 
And it relates to the idea of resistance and to the resistance model as a strategic model. And hence the, um, uh, its relations, relationship, its uh, working relationship or learning relationship, these organizations learn from one another. Uh, Hamas is uh, to a degree coordinated with Hezbollah, with Iran, with the Quds Force. Um, they are to a degree even coordinated with the Houthis in Iraq, in, uh, sorry, in Yemen, and also with the Iraqi militias. So in that respect, uh, yes, there is, uh, there is a conference conversation going on between Hamas and these other various resistance groups that find themselves in um, structurally in a similar situation where they are up against actors that are way more powerful than they are, but they're, and they're trying to, to basically shift a certain status quo uh, which, and, and, and impose a redistribution of power assets. So in that respect, yes, there is coordination between Hamas and Hezbollah. Hamas learns from Hezbollah. Hezbollah also learns from Hamas. Um, and these actors communicate and uh, collaborate to a certain degree with, uh, with one another. Uh, that is one of the most interesting things that, is, that are animating uh, geopolitics in, in, in the Middle East um, to an increasing degree over the past few years. Thank you all. I think one of the one of the big takeaways from this conversation is the, uh, you know, the interconnections between these things. Often, you know, the discourse, the focus is looking at in these as separate issues, and you know, whether it be the issues of Arab Jewish relations and Palestinian citizens of Israel, the issue of Israel and Hamas, uh, the issue of East Jerusalem and the the, the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif, and it actually, in many ways. There are lots of interconnections between these, uh, and they're not always understood. They're not always recognised, but it's uh, it creates um, a much more complex and dynamic picture. And also, as you just mentioned, Daniel, the interconnections between what's happening uh, in Israel and in Palestine with the wider region, of course. And we haven't even talked about uh, developments in the United States and and elsewhere as well. We've just begun to touch upon uh, many of these issues. I want to. Uh, thank all of our audience members for sending in so many questions. I tried to get through uh, quite a few of them, but uh, for lack of time, unfortunately, we weren't able to uh, answer them all or address them all, but I will share those questions with our panelists. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for their, for their contribution to this uh, very timely and uh, important conversation. Um, I want to thank all of our audience members for joining us. And I want to uh, just briefly take the uh, liberty of announcing our final event of the academic year, which will be taking place on Wednesday, June 16th, June 16th, from 10 a.m. to 11.30, so the same time as this uh, webinar. And we will hear from Yael Tamir, Yuli Tamir. She is the president of Beit Bell College in Israel, a former uh, cabinet minister, uh, and she will be discussing the influence of identity politics on the state of democracy in both Israel and the United States. So that's Yael Tamir on June the 16th. That will be our final event of the academic year. So please try and come to that. And I wanna thank all of our panelists again for a fascinating, thought-provoking conversation and our audience members for joining us and uh, take care and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you.